Prince Lear came home three days after he set out to slay the maiden fancying Ogre, with the great axe of Duke Alban slung behind him, and the Ogre's head bumping at his saddle bow. He offered neither prize to the Lady Amalthea, nor did he rush to find her with the monster's blood still brown on his hands. He had made up his mind, as he explained to Molly Grew in the scullery that evening, never more to trouble the Lady Amalthea with his attentions, but to live quietly in the thought of her, serving her ardently until his lonely death, but seeking neither her company, her admiration, or her love. "I will be as anonymous as the air she breathes," he said, "as invisible as the force that holds her to the earth." Thinking about it for a little, he added, "I may write a poem for her now and then, and slip it under her door, or just leave it somewhere for her to chance upon, but I won't ever sign the poem." "It's very noble," Molly said. She felt relieved that the Prince was giving up his courtship, and amused as well, and somewhat sad. "Girls like poems better than dead dragons and magic swords," she offered. "I always did, anyway, when I was a girl." The reason I ran off with Cully, but Prince Lear interrupted her, saying firmly, "No, do not give me hope. I must learn to live without hope, as my father does, and perhaps we will understand each other at last." He dug into his pockets, and Molly heard paper crackling. Actually, I've already written a few poems about it, hope and her and so on. You might look over them if you wanted to. I'd be very pleased," Molly said. "But will you never go out again then, to fight with black knights and ride through rings of fire?" The words were meant teasingly, but she found, as she spoke, that she would have been a little sorry if it were so, for his adventures had made him much handsomer, and taken off a lot of weight, and given him, besides, a hint of the musky fragrance of death that clings to all heroes. But the prince shook his head, looking almost embarrassed. Oh, I suppose I'll keep my hand in," he muttered. But it wouldn't be for the show of it, or for her to find out. It was like that at first. But you get into the habit of rescuing people, breaking enchantments, challenging the wicked duke in fair combat. It's hard to give up being a hero once you get used to it. Do you like the first poem? It certainly has a lot of feeling," she said. Can you really rhyme "bloomed" and "ruined"? It needs a bit of smoothing out," Prince Lear admitted. "Miracle is the word I'm worried about. I was wondering about grackle myself. No, the spelling. Is it one R and two Ls, or the other way around? One R, anyways, I think," Molly said. "Schmendrick," for the magician had just stooped through the doorway. "How many Rs in miracle? Two." He answered wearily, "It has the same root as mirror." Molly ladled him out a bowl of broth, and he sat down at the table. His eyes were hard and cloudy as jade, and one of the lids was twitching. "I can't do this very much longer," he said slowly. "It isn't this horrible place, and it isn't having to listening for him all the time. I'm getting rather good at that. It's that wretched cheap jack flummery he has me perform for him." Hours on end, all night last night. I wouldn't mind if he asked for the real magic, or even for a simple conjuring. But it's always the rings and goldfish, the cards and the scarves and the string, exactly as it was in the midnight carnival. I can't do it. Not much more. But that was what he wanted you for, Molly protested. If he wanted real magic, he'd have kept the old magician, that Mabrook. Schmendrick raised his head and gave her a look that was almost amused. "I didn't mean it like that," she said. "Besides, it's only for a little while until we find the way to the Red Bull that the cat told me about." She lowered her voice to a whisper as she spoke this last, and both of them glanced quickly over at the Prince Lear, but he was sitting on a stool in the corner, evidently writing another poem. "Gazelle," he murmured, tapping his pen against his lips. "Demoiselle." Citadel, Asvidel, Philomel, Parallel. He chose farewell and scribbled rapidly. We will never find the way," Schmendrick said very quietly. Even if the cat told the truth, which I doubt, Haggard will make sure we never have time to investigate the skull and the clock. 
Why do you suppose he piles more work on you every day, if not to keep you from prowling and prying in the great hall? Why do you think he keeps me entertaining him with my carnival tricks? Why do you think he took me as his wizard in the first place? Molly, he knows! I'm sure of it! He knows what she is, though he doesn't quite believe it yet. But when he does, he'll know what to do. He knows. I see it in his face sometimes. The lift of longing and the crash of loss, Prince Lear said. The bitterness of trump de ump de oss cross boss moss damn it Schmendrick leaned across the table. We can't wait here and wait for him to strike. The only hope we have is to escape at night, by sea perhaps, if I can lay hold of a boat somewheres. The men at arms will look the other way, and the gate But the others she cried softly. How can we leave when she has come so far to find the other unicorns and we know that they are here? Yet one small, tender, treacherous part of her was suddenly eager to be convinced of the quest's failure, and she knew it and was angry at Smendrick. Well, but what about your magic? she asked. What about your own little search? Are you going to give that up too? Will she die in human shape and you live forever? You might as well let the bull hive her then. The magician sank back, his face gone as pale and crumpled as a washerwoman's fingers. It doesn't really matter one way or the other, he said, almost to himself. She's no unicorn now, but a mortal woman. Someone for that lout to sigh over and write poems about. Maybe Haggard won't find her out at all. She'll be his daughter and he'll never know. That's funny. He put his soup aside, untasted, and leaned his head into his hands. I couldn't change her back into a unicorn if we did find the others, he said. There's no magic in me. Schmendrick, she began, but at that moment he jumped to his feet and rushed out of the scullery. Though she had not heard the king summon him, Prince Near Lear never looked up, but went on drumming meters and sampling rhythms. Molly hung a kettle over the fire for the sentry's tea. I've got it all but the final couplet, Lear said presently. Do you want to hear it now, or would you rather wait? Whichever you like, she said, so he read it then, but she never heard a word of it. Fortunately, the men-at-arms came in before he had finished reading, and he was too shy to ask her opinion in their presence. By the time they left, he was working on something else, and it was very late when he bade her good night. Molly was sitting at the table, holding her motley cat, the new poem was meant to be a sestina, and Prince Lear's head was jangling happily as he juggled the end words on his way up the stairs to his chamber. I will leave the first one on her door, he thought, and save the others until tomorrow. He was debating his original decision against signing his work, and playing with such pen names as The Knight of the Shadows and Le Chavire Malamé when he turned a corner and met the Lady Amalthea. She was coming down quickly in the dark, and when she saw him, she made a strange bleating sound and stood still three steps above him. She wore a robe that one of the king's men had stolen for her in Hagsgate. Her hair was down, and her feet were bare, and the sight of her on the stair sent such sorrow licking along Prince Lear's bones that he dropped his poems and his pretenses together, and actually turned to run. But he was a hero in all ways, and he turned bravely back to face her, saying in a calm and courtly manner, Give you good evening, my lady. The Lady Amalthea stared at him through the gloom, putting out a hand, but drawing it back before she touched him. Who are you? she whispered. Are you Rook? I'm Lear, he answered, suddenly frightened. Don't you know me? But she backed away, and it seemed to the prince that her steps were as flowing as an animal's, and that she even lowered her head in the way of a goat or a deer. He said, I am Lear. The old woman, said the Lady Amalthea. The moon went out. Oh! She shivered once, and then her eyes recognized him but all her body was still wild and watchful, and she came no nearer to him. "'You were dreaming, my lady,' he said, finding knightly speech again. "'I would that I might know your dream.' "'I have dreamed it before,' 
she answered slowly. "I was in a cage, and there were others beasts in cages, and an old woman. But I will not trouble you, my Lord Prince. I have dreamed it many times before." She would have left him then, but he spoke to her in a voice that only heroes have, as many animals develop a certain call when they become mothers. A dream that returns so often is like to be a messenger come to warn you of the future, or to remind you of things untimely forgotten. Say more of this, if you will, and I will try to riddle it for you. Thereupon she halted, looking at him, with her head a little turned, still with the air of some slim, furred creature peering out of a thicket, but her eyes held a human look of loss, as though she had missed something she needed, or something realized that she never had it. But if he had blinked, she would have been gone. But he did not blink, and he held her, and he had learned to hold griffins and chimeras motionless with his steady gaze. Her bare feet wounded him deeper than any tusk or river talon ever had. But he was a true hero. The Lady Amalthea said, In the dream there are black barred wagons, and beasts that are and are not, and a winged being that clangs like metal in the moonlight. The tall man has green eyes and bloody hands.